Acts 2, we'll start in verse 16. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Peter now quotes, as we've divided it, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. It shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Young men see visions. Old men dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. First thing Peter teaches to these Jews on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, is taken from Joel chapter 2, a kingdom prophecy. And what Joel chapter 2 is about, brother and sister, is, um, among other things, you could, you could say two stages of the kingdom. Two stages of the kingdom. The first stage has happened. Based on what Peter says, what was the first stage signaling the kingdom's beginning? <laughs> Pouring out of the Spirit. So the first stage of the kingdom is, I will pour forth of my Spirit upon all mankind. All mankind representatively through who in particular? Who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, verse 1 through 4? The apostles did, representative of all the Jews. Now, there are a number of reasons why the, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in an overwhelming or immersive way, baptism of the Holy Spirit. And one reason is, represent, they're all Jews, representative of all the Jews. The kingdom is open to the Jews. Kingdom is open to the Jews. But in addition to that, um, you have the promise of Jesus in John 16, the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into all truth, John 16, 13. They would be able to impart that truth, Acts 8, uh, and verse 18. Impart various gifts of the Spirit. they are numerous manifestations of the Holy Spirit. This is the baptismal measure, and my understanding is only two parties received the baptismal measure, the apostles in Acts 2. They were promised that in Acts 1, and Cornelius and his household in Acts 10, but uh, they were able to then impart a different manifestation, a gift of the Spirit, to first century Christians for the revelation of the word, to reveal, confirm truth. Um, but that's the first stage of the kingdom. Of course, they could work miracles. They're going to reveal truth, all truth, because of this, impart the Holy Spirit, nine different gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Um, to confirm the word, Jesus will say in Mark 16 and verse 20, the Lord work with them confirming the word with signs that followed. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them. That signals the beginning of the kingdom. It's open to the Jews. Now in Acts 10, in Acts 10, it's open to what group of people based on Cornelius and his household? Now it's open to uncircumcised Gentiles. There were actually circumcised Gentiles in the group in Acts 2. But these are uncircumcised Gentiles. 
These were proselytes in Acts 2, but these are uncircumcised. Now the kingdom, based on the Holy Spirit coming on Cornelius, is open to uncircumcised, in other words, all other nations, all other nations. They don't have to come through the Jewish nation to be in the kingdom. So I think all of us understand that, the significance of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles in Acts 2 and that being drawn from Joel chapter 2. So what about the last part of Joel's prophecy, though? The second stage of the kingdom, what does it pertain to? The second stage, let's read it. The second stage of the kingdom begins there in verse uh, 19. I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, great calamity is coming. You know, great, grand, lofty language is used here. Is this unusual language to a Jew? Is this strange? Is this, is this something they've never heard before? It shouldn't be. And if you've studied the prophets, as we've been doing some of that, uh, our brother Adam, Dan, teaching the prophets, then you, you recognize some of this language. This is the language of the prophets when God wants them to foretell the downfall of a nation, this is judgment upon a nation. And this is the kind of language God will use to say to these people, your world is ending. Your system is over. Your heaven and earth is going to come crashing down. Did I get your attention? Using language like this is what the Lord wants to accomplish. You know, and so your leaders your luminaries, your powers, they're all going to come down. It's coming to an end. And, and you see language like that throughout the prophets. Isaiah 13, Babylon. Uh, Isaiah 34, you'll read a, about Edom in similar language, Isaiah 34. Ezekiel 32, it will be Egypt, where God will use language like this. Now, those things didn't literally happen. Sun didn't become dark. The moon turned into blood. But figuratively, God has their attention to say, your heaven and earth is ending. And so that's the second stage. Now, what is Peter talking about? What nation is going to be judged and that be the second stage of the kingdom? The removal of an entire system is going to happen. And Joel prophesies it. Peter's bringing it out. He says, this is going to happen. What nation is he talking about? Good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in, in the case of that religious system, here it's not just a nation. And definitely it's a one time and they're not, it's not coming back. It's a system based on law. Everything Paul's trying to convince us about in Romans for the first 11 chapters, Paul's saying, we thank God according to his grace and mercy and wisdom that that system has been fulfilled and all of that was fully consummated when this occurred. That whole religious system, not just a nation, not just a temple, that system, that heaven and earth passed away. Okay? And it definitely is not coming back. Thank God it's not coming back. Because we cannot be saved on a system of law. Strictly law. What the law says is, buddy, you've sinned and you're in trouble. I can't do anything to help you, but you're in trouble. That's what the law says. This is where you stand, and it's not good. Only through the grace and mercy of God through Jesus and faith in his sacrifice do we have the hope that we have. So I, I just want you to see that this is something that's throughout Scripture. You have prophecies made about it. Deuteronomy 32, we studied last week. God says, I will carry vengeance 
on this people, a wicked, rebellious people. I will in time carry out vengeance, that which proceeds from justice. Vengeance is from God, justice, perfect justice. And he's about to do that. And he's announcing that again here in Joel's prophecy. Um, okay, we're going to move on from there. Uh, anybody have a, a, a comment, an additional comment there or question about that prophecy in Joel? Interesting where uh, that is placed and how Peter begins his sermon with that two-stage development in the kingdom. Look at Matthew 24, if you will. Let's go to Matthew now, 24. The same kind of language I want you to notice is here. Matthew 24. One of the, I hope to give a sermon someday um, showing, I believe the Lord is returning but not based upon some of the scriptures people use. You know, the Lord is returning. There's going to be a resurrection and all of that. But right now, we're, we're not looking at one of those passages that teach a final return of the Lord. We're looking at a national judgment that was escapable. And uh, that's, that's what I believe the context shows. Look at Matthew 24, 29. And, and it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, here it is, the sun will be darkened, moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The Jewish religious system is going to come to a complete end. And God is using, again, lofty symbols, grand figures, to help us understand that world is ending, thankfully. In verse 30, and then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in the sky, and that all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He's going to come in power and great glory, in this case, through the Roman Empire. They will be his vehicle, just as the Medes and the Persians were the vehicle of God in punishing the Babylonians, and he'll say, I'm going to raise them up, I'm using it, I'm doing this, God is going to do that. And here he did the same thing, but he used the Roman Empire as his vehicle. Now, remember the time text. While you're in Matthew 24, remember the time text, verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Anytime you have that demonstrative pronoun connected to this generation, there are six times you'll see it connected together. This generation, this generation, in various places. You see it in Matthew 23. You see it here. It always has reference to the present generation, the contemporary generation, not some generation thousands of years into the future, which is what many preachers want their churches to believe because of a doctrine known as premillennialism. It is a false doctrine. This, this happened. I want you to see whatever this passage is saying, it happened in that generation, okay? Because the time text will not allow anything otherwise. It happened in that generation. Um, in, uh, let's go to Matthew 3. Go all the way back in Matthew to chapter 3, and I want you to see, brethren, that Matthew starts making mention of this national judgment that's going to come upon the wicked nation of the Jews, an unbelieving nation. He starts very early, Matthew chapter 3, and uh, look at verse 7, Matthew 3, 7. It says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring forth fruit in keeping with your repentance. In other words, what John is asking is, are you aware? Are you here because you're aware that wrath is coming upon you and your nation? 
Of course, they were not. They were not aware of that. And even though Jesus and John tried to warn them, they didn't believe it. John was aware of it, though. John knew about it. And so he's saying, you know what? You need to do this because terrible things are going to happen, and you're going to be unprepared. And so John goes on to say in verse 9, don't suppose you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. I say to you, from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Physical lineage won't be enough to give you a place in the kingdom. True children of Abraham are children of faith. Verse 10, look at this. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. See that? The axe is already in place. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so John is, is again telling them God's axe of judgment is already in motion. This forest of thorn trees is about to be cut down. God prophesied it. He cannot lie. It's going to happen. So verse 11, as for me, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you, we just read about it in Acts 2, with Holy Spirit and with fire. And so again, John sets forth the same two stages. What Peter says in Acts 2, 16 through 21, John says very succinctly here, it's the same thing he's talking about. There's going to be a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In this case, it, it's on the apostles who represents all Judaism. The kingdom is open to the Jews. And the second stage is what? Based on uh, verse 12. What's the second stage? His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He'll gather his wheat into the barn, but what about those that are not bearing fruit for him? See that? There's your second stage. They will be punished with unquenchable fire. So you got your two stages announced by John in Matthew 3, and then Peter will uh, bring them out later on. City of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, burned, and those carcasses will be thrown into Gehenna by the Roman army. Uh, look at Matthew 16, 26. Matthew 16, 26. Something is kind of glossed over in a, in a, sometimes in a study, but it should not be, and it need not be. In verse 26, for what will a man profit if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at this, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. And then verse 28, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, did it happen or not? God cannot lie. And it happened in the lifetime of some of those people. Kingdom began, and the Jewish kingdom came crashing down. The Lord's kingdom began, and the Jewish kingdom came to an end through the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew 21, look at Matthew 21. In verse 42, here's the chief priest and the Pharisees especially. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. This is one of the clearest statements of God's rejection of fleshly Israel in the Bible. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. He who falls on this stone, of course, that's Jesus, will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them. They're going to be facing this. And then look, at, look with me at Matthew 23, Matthew 23, verse 37. 
Jesus warned in very specific terms, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Now, this is Matthew's gospel. All the gospels will echo these kind of thoughts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, not as much, but I think John does a great deal in the book of Revelation. But look with me at Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13. In verse 1, here is uh, an occasion, teachable moment, Jesus is saying about the Jewish concept of sin and punishment in this life. On that same occasion, there was some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And the Jews thought about sin almost like karma. You know, oh, they must have sinned because some physical thing, you know, bad thing happened. They lost their job or they died. Somebody near to them died. But that Jesus said, no, that is not necessarily the case. And we must not make that same serious mistake today. Sin has consequences, but the spiritual consequences is what we need to focus on. Verse 2, he answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you suppose those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, unless you repent, you're all, you will all likewise perish. The, the entire nation, if they did not change, if they did not stop their rebellious attitude, they were going to fall. They were going to be destroyed. And Jesus is warning them about that. Um, let me just, just cite a few passages here. Most of the New Testament writers, most of the New Testament writers, they will allude to this in some way or just echo what Jesus presents as a pattern in Matthew 24, Luke 17, and Luke 21. Peter will put it this way, the end of all things is near. James will say, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Paul will say, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's in Romans 16. John will say, children, it is the last hour. You've heard many antichrists are coming. Antichrist is coming. Indeed, many have come. Not one, but many. Anybody who's against Christ. And then in Hebrews, it's yet in a very little while, he's coming, will come, and will not delay. In Ephesians 1, it's Paul still talking about the age to come. Ephesians 1.21. So all of this language is simply looking ahead to the culmination of God's special relationship with Israel. But that special relationship to the Jew first, remember Romans 1.16, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile, that's about to end. That's why Paul said that, Romans 1.16, because they were given the first opportunity for one generation. And then once they heard it, then no more. No more special privileges over anybody else. And so, of course, that, that has now happened. I'd like to get back to chapter 24, but before I do, someone have a comment or a question about any of these things we're looking at here. This is a really big deal in Scripture. Again, it doesn't mean that the Lord isn't coming back someday. There's going to be a, a, a universal resurrection, but there is a lot on these things that people, for some reason, just discount or gloss over. There's no reason for that. And I don't think the context will allow you to do that. There are imminent statements, imminent statements. And I don't think we should just gloss over those imminent statements. They mean what they say. Soon, shortly, Revelation will use the same kind of language. Revelation 1.3. And we'll say of Revelation, well, that's how you know premillennialism is a false doctrine because John says this will soon happen. It's going to take place shortly. Well, it means that. And so do these other writers, shortly, soon. Uh, 
Well, go with me to Matthew 24 now. Let's look back at the, uh, the whole chapter. Verse 20, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple, was going away when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings. Jesus' words of Jerusalem's destruction still ringing in their ear, and they want to know when that's going to happen. And so, um, verse 2, he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another. And so he says, yeah, this is going to happen. It's going to be destroyed. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? I believe there's one event with three details. When are you going to come? When will all these things be destroyed? What will be the end of the age? I think it's one event with three details. I do not believe I do not believe the disciples accept at this point even his death. I want you to think about that. I don't think mentally they're anywhere near there that they even accept his death, let alone his resurrection, ascension, and then coming. You got to get several steps in there to get the idea that there's two final comings here. So, I think it's one event, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, and there's three details. When are you going to come and do this? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And so on. And so Jesus warns them. The reason this instruction is given is to prepare them so that Christians will not have to go through this. And so verse 4, he said, see to it, no one misleads you. There will be a lot of false indicators. Verse 5, many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and will, will mislead many. Many false Christs indeed arose during this time period. It was a very turbulent time. They were ripe for things like this. Verse 6, you'll be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened. Those things must take place. This is not yet the end. Now, what end are we talking about in context? What end is this? It's the end of the age. And it's the same end as verse 13. The one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. And when that happens, verse 16, what should the people do? Get out, get out of Dodge. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop go, not go down to get things out of the house. Your life is more important than those things. Um, look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel, we just read about that. That's mentioned three times in Daniel. The abomination of desolation. It's the Roman army, which is an abomination, and they're wreaking desolation upon Jerusalem. Daniel prophesies that in chapter 9, 24 through 27, and in two other places, he'll prophesy that. Uh, there's going to be an abominable thing surrounding Jerusalem. It's going to destroy Jerusalem and leave it desolate. And so you believe my words, then as soon as you see that indicator, get out of there. Save your life. Early writers tell us, Eusebius is one of them, I recall, that Christians escaped this judgment. And Eusebius says there's no record of any Christians dying during this time period in, in the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't know. That's what he records. Uh, I think he's a fourth century writer. But he says that's what he understood. So if that's true, and, and obviously the majority of Christians certainly escaped this judgment, how did they escape this judgment? How did they know? They listened to Jesus. They believed Jesus. They listened to Jesus. And as soon as there was any indication that the Roman army was approaching, and by the way, the Roman army didn't just go straight to Jerusalem. They made their way down, you know, through Galilee and Judea, killing people on the way. It was a process. And then they surrounded Jerusalem. Evidently, during Passover time is what we're told. It lasted for about five months, five to six months. Passover time, more Jews. And it got to a point where Titus would say, yeah, go on into the city for the Passover, but he wouldn't let them come out. And Flavius Josephus, a historian, says 
Over a million Jews were slain in this destruction, over 1 million Jews. And 100,000 sold into slavery. That's his accounting of that. It was indeed a horrible, terrible time for the Jewish nation. But that's the end that Jesus is, is warning them about so that they can escape it. And they did, for the most part. If no record of Christians being killed in it anyway. So verse 16, let's go back to that. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. But it was the same thing God warned them in the past, and He said, If you trust me, you'll mm -hmm. live. But if you're arrogant and trust yourself, you'll die. Same situation uh, Eddie's bringing out here in Habakkuk chapter 2. That was a great study, by the way, brother. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, and that's where he says, The righteous shall live by faith. You trust me, and you know, you'll get through this, but you'll, of course, eternally be saved. But the righteous shall live by faith, and that's a statement quoted numerous times in the New Testament, Habakkuk 2, verse 4. But that's about the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. And uh, you know, God is, you know, similar things, similar warnings, you know, during that time period, repent or else. Uh, anything else, brother? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay. Um, let's go a little further, if we may, please. In verse 19, woe to those who are with child, who nurse babes in those days, obviously more difficult for travel. Pray your flight may not be in the winter or Sabbath. Winter time is the rainy season. That would really make it tough for travel. Um, the Sabbath day, because... If, if things were still like they were in the days of Nehemiah, the gates would be closed. But if that's not the warning or the reason he says that, it could be because the Jews enforcing the Sabbath laws. You can't travel more than this distance. And so they might be or try to enforce the Sabbath laws. Pray it won't happen on the Sabbath day. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Daniel would say the same thing in chapter 12, verse 1. In verse 22, unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. Again, I want you to, to recall that time text down in verse 34. Go with me down there. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, what did Jesus say about prayer in these days? What did he say? How did he empower Christians in this sermon? The power of prayer. The power of prayer. Because we believe in the power of God, we believe in the power of prayer. The power is not in an outlet. The power is in electricity coming through that outlet. The power is not just in prayer, it's in God who answers prayer. And so we pray as our brother Angel prayed tonight for Leandra and Ernestine and Jennifer and others who, who we know if, if it's God's will, he will heal them. He will make them well because we believe in the power of God and God would have it no other way. And so he says, you know, whatever you ask in my name, if it's according to my will, he says, I will hear you. God always answers prayer, by the way. He always answers prayer, doesn't he? Yes, no, or be patient. Be patient. Yes, brother. It tells them that they can actually change the circumstances of this great day by their prayer. I know. He doesn't tell them, pray that he won't come. Yeah, because that's true. Not in God's will. Come. Yeah. But he said you can change the circumstances. This is going to happen, but you can you can change. And just think about that. Their prayer could change the day. It could change the day. And uh, evidently it did, based on Eusebius' record. 
and other early writers. That's, that's a tremendous privilege that we're given. And so the, the reason why I believe it says of that day and hour, no one knows because prayer could change that day and hour. Uh, that's the kind of, of power God has put in our hands and, and love he has for us. So he goes on to talk about uh, readiness and preparedness. In verse 37, the coming of the Son of Man will be just as in the days of Noah, as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Now, we're running out of time, and so I want to show you this real quickly in Luke's account. Luke, if you will, look in Luke chapter uh, 17, please. Luke 17. In Luke 17, Luke's account only teaches one coming of Jesus. It does not allow for a transition from one to another. Luke 17, 24, just as lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Verse Matthew 24, 27 is the same thing. Matthew 24, 27. Now, after verse 25 of Luke's account, Luke 17, 25, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And then verse 26, what does it say? Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and flood came and destroyed them all. Now that's the same as Matthew 24, 37 through 39. Except where does Luke put it? Where does Luke put it? Uh, verse, look at verse 31. On that day, let no one who's on the housetop and whose goods are in the house go down and take them away. Likewise, let no one who's in the field turn back remember Lot's wife. So where does Luke put that message of preparedness and readiness? Where does he put it? Yeah, you can say it because it's right there. There's no transition here. It's one thing. It's one coming. It's the Lord coming against Jerusalem. And Luke shows that all of that goes together. And his account will not allow for another coming down the road. It's, it's just not there. Now, neither is, where do you find in Matthew 21, Matthew 22, 23, which is part of the large context, neither do you find teaching about a final coming of the Lord in those chapters. And so, again, in the verbal neighborhood, it's just not there. And so there's no reason to bring that out. You have other passages that teach that. But here, again, Luke's account, there's only one coming. It doesn't allow for a transition. Um, okay, we're going to have to, we're going to have to stop there, I guess. Um, I'll leave you with, with this comment also. How gracious is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to prepare his people for this day? How gracious he was. He said all of this, and the other writers continued that message. They simply echo this pattern in their letters because they, they want them to know this is going to happen, and you need to be prepared, and you need to save your families. This, this is a message of mercy and grace for Christians. Message of judgment for the Jew, unbelieving Jews, but mercy and grace for the Christians. Thank God for his grace and mercy. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you very much.